Okay, session's being recorded. Um, so yeah, everybody, my name's Cal. Uh, I've been out the last couple of months actually on paternity leave, so I'm just playing a little catch up here. Uh, but I originally created this PowerPoint uh, for Priaxor. So I'm assuming everyone here is pretty much coffee growers. Everyone here is commercial agriculture. I can't see too many of you. I figured out at least my grid view now so I can see some of you. Um, but basically wanted to start off with saying uh, when it comes to pesticides that the label is the law. Um, in 1975, FIFRA was established, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, Rodenticide Act set up specific rules for pesticide regulations. Uh, basically, what this does is, is basically gives us power to enforce these laws. Um, pesticides always will say on top of the on top of the label is a violation of federal law to use this product in a manner inconsistent with its labeling. That includes sections for PPE, sites, uh, dilution rates, storage disposal, and other restrictions. Uh, label sites, this one's really basic. If you want to use a pesticide anywhere, you need to have the site on the label. Um, in this case, I'm assuming we are all growing coffee here. So if you want to use a pesticide um, on coffee, it's got to have coffee on the label. There are some pesticides with, uh, you know, subcrop groups on here where you would be able to use uh, any crops in that subcrop group. However, uh, Coffee is not listed uh, in any of the uh, subcrop groups, so coffee must be on the label to use the pesticide on uh, coffee. Uh, Priaxor originally does not have coffee as an application site. All right, so how can we use it on there? We've created what, or we've applied for and got approval for what is called a Section 18 label. So again, uh, FIFRA sets it out. Um, the whole laws and everything like that. Section 18 of FIFRA authorizes EPA to exempt state and federal agencies from provisions of FIFRA and allow unregistered uses of pesticides to address emergency conditions. Uh, four types of emergency exemptions may be authorized. Uh, this one here, I do believe we're operating under is the significant economic loss uh, of coffee. Oh, I lost my little thing here. Um, yep. So in order to get this, you have to go through a whole checklist, send a bunch of info to EPA. It's not super important for you guys to know that. Just know that there is a process online uh, that you guys can go check out how, how this all went down. Um, the main thing is we got the Section 18 approved and we now have an exemption for coffee. So we can use the Priaxor on coffee. Um, under this section 18 label, uh, the PPE for this product is going to be chemical resistant gloves, 14 milliliters or thicker, or excuse me, 14 mils or thicker. Um, gloves can be made of barrier laminate, butyl rubber, nitro rubber, all sorts of these rubbers here listed on the screen. As long as they're the thick kind, those thinner ones from Costco and things like that aren't going to be thick enough. Uh, we also need a respirator for this product. That means going to need fit testing and medical clearance to use that respirator prior to, to using it. Um, the types of respirators you guys will be... Oh, I ended it. The type of respirators you guys can use is a NIOSH face filtering respirator, which is just those, those uh, N95s that we've been using all around. I uh, can use the elastomere one, which is the half face respirator, or if you guys want to go crazy, you guys can get a positive flow respirator. Uh, again, following the PPE section of the label, we're going to need eye protection. Uh, a lot of the times people just wear sunglasses. This is not proper eye protection. Uh, these, it requires, excuse me, where is it at? Protective eyewear, which is going to need brow protection and temple protection. Uh, your site should be coffee. Everyone here is growing coffee. It's for the coffee exemption. All right, here, getting into the meat of the label here. It's not a very long label. Uh, basically, you guys are going to be allowed to use this product twice a year. Any, any more than that is going to be a label violation. The max rate, excuse me, per application is going to be 7.14 fluid ounces per acre per year. Um, or excuse me. I said that incorrectly. It's gonna be 7.14 fluid ounces maximum per application with a total max application of 14.28 uh, ounces per year. I can't see with that yet. 
Uh, minimum PHI, so if you guys spray today, you won't be able to harvest till 45 days. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I do believe it's kind of coming into the harvesting season, so that may be an issue if you guys are trying to spray right away. Uh, minimum um, days in between reapplication, I do believe is 30 days. I got to move this. Yep, minimum retreatment interval for Praxer is going to be 30 days. Um, and that's really, you know, this label's only only two pages long here, in front and back. So that that is the, the main thing you guys are going to have to take a look out for. There's a couple other little uh, restrictions on here. Um, again, like we said in the rates one, uh, 7.14 in a single application, no more than 14.28 fluid ounces per acre per year. Uh, the other thing is you cannot make more than two sequential applications of Pryaxa before alternating for a non-group 11 product. So what that basically means is uh, different pesticides uh, kill pests uh, by different actions. Uh, so it doesn't go through the same route. So it, this is basically so you aren't breeding uh, pesticide resistant pests. Um, so you'll see on top of the pesticide label, it'll have a group number. And on the right side here, it just gives some, you know, random examples of these group numbers. Um, so basically, you can't use this, this prioxer more than twice without switching to another fungicide first. And that's for breeding resistance. Uh, other restrictions, uh, you're going to have to use the Prioxor with sufficient water, a minimum of 20 gallons uh, per acre, uh, only ground application, no aerial, no drone applications. Uh, this is going to be only for use in field grown coffee. So if you guys have coffee in a nursery or for transplant, you cannot use the Prioxor there, only in your field grown coffee. Um, the other restrictions, uh, your user must be in position of the section 18 label and the container label as well. So if you guys are going to be using this product, you're going to have to get a copy of the label. Um, I can provide you guys a copy of the label via email, uh, although the dealers should also be able to provide you these, this information. And so I'm going a little bit quick here, just trying to catch up with time. This one here is going to be some interesting um, applications here. You guys are going to have to maintain a 25 foot buffer between the point of application and the edge of the field. So if you guys have coffee going right up to the edge of your field, um, it's going to need it's going to need a buffer there. Uh, the other thing is they're going to need a buffer, a vegetative buffer strip on the low end on the downhill side of your guys's fields to produce uh, to reduce runoff. Um, since this PowerPoint has been created, EPA, the only thing I noticed that EPA added is that there is now environmental hazards on there. So it says uh, you cannot apply directly to water, areas where surface water is present, intertidal areas below, or excuse me, below the mean high water mark. Uh, do not apply where runoff is likely to occur. Uh, basically, there's a surface water advisory on this product. Um, the chemical has properties and characteristics associated with chemicals directed, detected, excuse me, in groundwater. Uh, the chemical has possibility to leach into uh, groundwater in areas where soils are permeable, particularly where water tables are shallow. So we are worried about um, the runoff and it getting in the water. Um, this is a foliar product. You're going to want to spray, uh, you're going to want to direct your sprays to the canopy. Um, you're not going to be allowed to spray this when wind speeds uh, exceed 15 miles per hour at the application site. This product does not say you are required to take a, a wind reading right before, but you guys are going to have to ensure uh, that you are not applying in winds exceeding 15 miles per hour, however you guys want to uh, end up dealing with that. Uh, another thing I think you guys get them a little bit more in Kona is temperature inversions occur in the early morning and late evenings. Uh, temperature inversion is when you get a pocket of warm air trapped above the cooler air. This allows for small particles, small droplets uh, to get caught and, and basically travel sideways, really incre increases uh, chances for, for drifting this product. Um, it's on the label statement. Um, 
I'm not a meteorologist, so I'm not the best at explaining exact uh, science behind the temperature inversion, um, but it generally happens in, in times when there's dead winds. Um, it's, it's really better to be applying this in one to two mile an hour winds, just very, very light winds is better than no wind at all. No, no wind at all can indicate this, um, this temperature inversion happening. Other restrictions, chemigation, we're not allowed to use chemigration. Again, we're not allowed to use this product at, uh, aerially and we're not allowed to use it in greenhouses, nurseries or transplant productions, only in field grown coffee. Um, that's basically going over the entire label I do believe after this, we jump into worker protection standards. Oh, nope. Sorry, I was wrong. Tank mixing. Um, there's nothing really against the tank mixing on this one. It just wants you to uh, do test areas on a small portion of the crop if you guys do plan on tank mixing. I don't know if anyone's really planning on tank mixing. I can't really see a show of hands. But um, it's only the tank mixed with the adjuvants and surfactant. That's it. No other uh, tank mix combination. Sorry, excuse me. So you cannot mix this with any other products then? Only surfactant or adjuvants. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. That was my mistake on there. I'll have to change that. My bad. So you cannot mix this with other products. I lied. Only uh, adjuvants and uh, other surfactants to make the product uh, basically not drift as much, stick better to your crop, things like that. Man. Anyway, so I missed that little part. On to the worker protection standards. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with worker protection standards, uh, as commercial coffee growers, you should probably familiarize yourself with those. Basically, we were talking about FIFRA earlier. Those are the federal regulations. Uh, I wanna say in 95, uh, FIFRA, uh, the worker protection standards got added to FIFRA. Um, and that were basically to keep farm workers safe. So if you guys are running a commercial farm in which you employ workers or handlers, you will have to provide certain protections for these workers and handlers uh, due to this national law. Um, we do have a little brochure here available. Um, just tells a little bit about worker protection standards. I do have another worker protection standard PowerPoint. The entire thing's probably an hour and a half on its own. So I'm not gonna get super detailed on this. And I do wanna be able to open this up to questions. Um, here, let me take a peek at the time, 502. Um, so basically what this is talking about is if you guys do have workers that you pay to be on your farm, you guys are going to have to have a central notification, and excuse me, if you have workers and handlers that are on your farm and you're using this pesticide, you're going to have to follow the worker protection standards. Part of that is having a central notification site that has safety information, uh, safety data sheets, pesticide application information, um, many other things like that. Another thing you guys will have to do is you're going to have to provide training for your workers and handlers. Um, this is an annual safety video that they must view um, or go through the training uh, under the supervision of a qualified trainer. Um, you can become a certified applicator to become a qualified trainer. You can go through a train the trainer program or you can have someone that is a certified applicator provide this training for you. Um, training used to be a very specific video. Now it must be EPA approved. Um, there is a very handy website I can give you guys, I think, may I go backwards? No, it doesn't have it on here, but it's pesticideresources.org um, has, a, has a wealth of information on it regarding worker protection standards. Um, let's see here. For the worker protection standards, you guys are also going to have to keep, uh, well, records of the training, but under the central notification site, you're going to have to keep records of application separate from your records of application required by the section 18 label. This form, and I'm sorry to jump around at the end here. I didn't create the end of this one. This form is, a, is the training sign in, sign out. Um, you guys on top of providing the training have to keep a record of the training. There's the safety poster. I wanted to jump into, okay, decon materials. This is what I was more looking for. 
Um, so with worker protection standards, you're going to have to keep a record of your applications, uh, including product name, EPA reg numbers, active ingredients, uh, things like this. These records must remain posted at your central notification site for 30 days at least, and then you're gonna have to keep these records uh, for two years. Um, this is on top of the PRIAXA records that you guys are going to have to be keeping. Um, you're gonna have to have the name of the applicator, phone number, email address, name of farm, all this information as well. And you will have to submit this information to uh, Department of Agriculture within 10 days of the application of PRIAXA. Greg, were you going to jump in and say something there? Nope, just the uh, 10 days. <laughs> 10, yeah, yeah, yeah. So within, within 10 days, you guys are going to have to uh, turn this information in. And actually, correct me, I, I've been out for about the last month and a half. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but is there still the um, prior warning? Do they have to, to inform us seven days prior, or is it now just the 10 days notification? Yes, uh, so it is the, we do require a seven day notification prior to, uh, your application of Preaxor. Okay, so uh, yeah, like Greg just said, um, you guys will have to inform us at least seven days advanced prior to applying this product. Um, if you guys know exactly when you're going to apply it, two months from now, you can uh, you can you can notify us more than seven days in advance. But we need at minimum seven days ad uh, advance notice when you guys are going to apply this, and then after it's applied, we're going to need the record within ten days. Um, that to jump in, I skipped some things. Sorry, I don't usually do worker protection standards in this order. With worker protection standards, this is an example of the, the safety poster. You guys are also going to need decon materials for all your workers. Um, all these decon materials and safety posters have to be within one quarter mile of all your workers and handlers. And we can get in those definitions as well. Um, for the sake of time, though, I'm not going to delve that deep. And I think we are really just going to open it up to questions. So, so sorry, this is, this is all the information that's going to be required to be reported. And again, Greg, correct me if I'm wrong. We have a form already ready to go for this that people can use to fill out. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, all of the dealers uh, were provided with a packet. Uh, it has, hold on, let me get my video so that you're not I'm not just talking in a black screen. Uh, all the dealers were provided a packet with frequently asked questions, uh, notification, the information that the notifications are required, um, the reporting requirements as well. Uh, and I think there was one other, I can't remember what the last uh, part of the packet was, but uh, yeah, they were provided the packets and the packet should be going out to anybody who purchases Preax or uh, for the use of coffee. Are we, as Department of Agriculture, able to provide these directly to growers as well, or only yep. dealers? Okay. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, if, if you want to reach out, I think uh, one of the last slides has our contact information. If you want to reach out to any of the uh, education specialists, uh, myself included, but luckily my name's not on there, so, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, we can get you the information. Yeah. Yeah, so rather than read, you know, all, all the information straight off the PowerPoint, um, I think We'll open it up for questions. Did anyone have anything, Andrea or Greg, you want to add? Hey, Kel, um, would you mind if I shared my screen? I wanted to show everybody um, my website and uh, where they can find some of this information as well. Okay, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will stop sharing and then you can go ahead. Oh, I wonder if I can. Okay, you know what? Let me. Just try this and I'm gonna move it over. Yep. I think. Can you guys see um, the website here? Hawaii Coffee. So it's hawaiicoffee.com. And under the coffee leaf rust uh, heading, there is a section for Preax or Zemium information. If you click on that, you're gonna come to this web page. Uh, and it provides the specimen label, which the container would normally come with. And then you can also download the section 18 label. So you'll need both of those labels um, if you're going to be applying this product and you have to keep it on hand uh, with the product. Uh, I've also loaded up the instructions from HDOA for the applicators. Um, so 
notifying HDOA at least seven days prior to applying Fiaxor is a required element, um, as well as the um, pesticide application form, which is required to be completed and submitted to HDOA within 10 days of the Fiaxor application. Um, well, this uh, handout that I created is not meant to replace or substitute any of the product or Section 18 labels. Um, I've tried to simplify some of the information and have it available to you in this handout. Um, also, if you kind of scroll down a little bit more, we've got some of the pesticide logs and examples of these logs that you can use for WPS. Uh, I've also included a link to the website for information on worker protection standard, as well as train the trainer information. Uh, past Preaxer uh, webinars that we've had, um, we've collected some of the questions and Greg's created answers to those frequently asked questions. And if you just click there in the blue, uh, you can pull up and download the facts coming from past presentations. Um, Department of Ag's contact inf information is also there. Uh, so, you know, this website can at least help kind of collect all the information, handouts and such, and uh, hopefully make it easier for you guys to find it. Um, please feel free to visit this. It's hawaiicoffeeed.com slash info.html. So um, I will. Stop sharing and uh, you guys have any other uh, things to say? We can open up to questions otherwise. So there was a there was a question in the chat. Is there a minimum number of farms needed to use prax or in the emergency exemption in order to gain full permitted use? Um, so for the section 18 uh, in the application for it, we had to show EPA that there would be a significant economic impact, not necessarily a number of farms. So if there's only a small amount of crop grown on island, they likely wouldn't issue the exemption. Um, if that answers your question there. Greg, were you going to say something? Yeah, uh, so we are currently working with the registrant who is BASF uh, to gain what's what you're referring to as full permitted use, uh, which is adding coffee to the section three label. Uh, the only problem with that is it takes sometimes up to two years uh, to get that um, site, a new site onto a label. So in the meantime, we do have the, the um, exemption for use on coffee uh, and we can't, it, it, it is a one year exemption, but we can and most likely will, uh, you know, uh, reapply for that uh, section 18 next year. So we had, what is the shelf life of Praxer? Uh, they would not use it in a year. I don't know that information off the top of my head. That, that's something I could try and look up. Uh, does anyone know that one? Uh, I don't believe there was a stated shelf life uh, on the section three label. There, there's not, generally speaking, pesticide companies don't like to tell you how long their product is <laughs> for. Uh, so here, let me write that down though. Shelf life, we can try and look it up. And then who is carrying Praxor and what do we need to purchase it? I don't know, but I know at, at least most of the major chemical guys, you know, Simplot, BEI, uh, CPSI um, are going to be carrying it. Um, I'm not sure. I don't think places like Home Depot, but I'm not, again, I'm not 100% sure. Um, and what do you need to purchase it? For purchasing it, ooh, that's a good, it's not restricted use, so anyone could technically purchase it. So you, would, you wouldn't really need anything to purchase it. You would just need to give us the notification and then um, after the fact, report it. And then- Nutrien also carries it. I'm not sure if Nutrien is on Maui though. Um, that Maggie's from Maui, uh, so. Maggie, why don't you give me a buzz later or, you know, try and get in touch with, um, with you on that and see who, who's carrying it on Maui. I'm not sure if um, EI has brought it in. I don't think Nutrien is there on island, that's why. They, yeah, they are not. Uh, I, I think uh, Simplot should be able to get it. Okay. Yeah, I was talking to Pete Ballerini and he, I know he had expressed interest in purchasing some for, for their growers. Uh, Iris, uh, this is Iris from BEI. 
So I know we have on Oahu, um, but every island orders their own. So I'd, I'd have to check with Imelda if she did order some. I'm not sure. Yeah. For, for Maui, that is. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Iris. And then extra reap record keeping 10 day notification. Is there something particularly noxious about Proxer? No, not, not, I mean, from, from just looking at it, it's, it's got a signal word of caution. I want to say on there, I have it right here. Um, I mean, with all pesticides, you should always err on the side of safety. And this is just not a use. Um, usually in order to use a pesticide in any particular area, it takes years and years of, of research and testing to see what it'll actually do. And then, um, you know, it's, it's just, a, it's a lot of money to do it. So it's, it's more erring on the side of caution, from my understanding, that EPA is not just going to let you go out and, and do whatever with it. And we want to be able to track who is using it and where it is going. Yeah, so that actually came uh, to clarify. It's a seven-day notification prior to application. Um, that notification period provides the Department of Agriculture time to basically randomize the list of applicators who are notifying us so that we can have an inspector come out and uh, ensure that the product is being used appropriately. You know, that's one of the things that allowed us um, to let EPA feel like they're, you know, uh, these products aren't just going to be out willy nilly. Uh, so, you know, we have to have an enforcement side as well as the education side, which you folks are participating in right now. Um, another question, just reading them off, I can't necessarily answer them. Uh, one neighbor, uh, if one's neighbor wants to apply Praxer, do you need to maintain the 25 foot buffer? That is a good question. The way I would answer it just shooting from the hip is yes, you would because of the label language saying your field, not necessarily your maintain a 25 foot buffer between point of application and the edge of field. Yeah, right. Cal, you're right. Um, you know, I, I spoke to our case developers. I spoke to our enforcement uh, guys. I spoke to our uh, deputy AG. Uh, that is what's on the label. Uh, unfortunately, that means there's a 50 foot line of coffee that potentially would not be treated with Preaxor. Um, Between neighbors. Yeah, you know, that's the that's the rules that we got with the uh, um, the registrant, and ultimately the registrants, uh, you know they're providing us with the product and uh, they have to support the use of the product. Uh, so they're, they're erring on the side of caution. I got, I got another question directly to me. How effective has it been proven against CLOR? Um, I, I, I don't know that information. Do we have a fact, uh, excuse me, do we have any data on, on efficacy? There is data on efficacy from other countries, and this was submitted with the Section 18. So there is um, evidence that it does protect against coffee leaf rust. Okay. Yeah, so other coffee producing countries, Costa Rica, Brazil, uh, I believe there was Portugal in there, um, a bunch of South American countries uh, do use Preaxor on coffee. Um, and that is what uh, the Hawaii Coffee Association and, and others uh, in conjunction with the Department of Agriculture uh, came up with to push, you know, not necessarily push, but, you know, get this as a product for you folks to be able to use uh, in rotation with other products. Okay, and then we have what is best time to apply after pruning, after flowering. Um, I don't know that information as well. So from BASF, the uh, manufacturer Preaxor, they did say that uh, it should be applied as a preventative. So when applied preventatively, um, this fungicide forms a protective barrier on the leaf surface and along with its translaminar properties will stop CLR infection from germinating spores and subsequent colonization on the underside of the leaf surface. So it doesn't kill CLR spores, but it helps to protect the leaves for about 14 to 21 days after application from new spores germinating on the leaf and making new infections and lesions. So the best timing really is um, when you have a low level of CLR or as a preventative spray. 
And also you have to keep in mind that you should not be applying this product um, anywhere within 45 days of harvest. Yeah, and to answer the second question, uh, the second question is what is the consequence if a farmer makes an error in application such as too small buffer area? Uh, you know, generally it, it's written in state law that uh, any private applicator uh, is afforded a warning notice. Uh, you know, that, that doesn't preclude the department from, you know, increasing fines or, or fining someone, but generally, and it's pretty general, I mean, about 100% of the time, we give out warning notices first, uh, especially if they're, you know, just small things like, oh, well, you didn't measure wind speed or uh, the, your, your edge of field was 20 feet instead of 25 feet. Uh, so there, there is a warning notice prior to um, another inspection, a follow-up inspection. And if the follow-up inspection uh, finds issues and violations, then we can you know, start taking it up a notch. And there are um, fines associated. It, it can get up to $5,000 per occurrence, um, but I've seen few and far between uh, for, for agriculture. Yeah, depend, depending on the severity of it, I remember a couple of years back, they, there was one guy, it was a completely different product, but he was continually on, you know, violating labels and, and ended up being a criminal case guy, served some, some prison time for it. Um, guidance regarding disposal of excess leftover mix. I would say um, don't end up with uh, a leftover mix. Calculate how many gallons you're going to need and calculate how many acres you have so you don't have leftover mix. Um, regarding that, if you do, um, you'll need to spray it out on a, uh, a labeled site. So if you accidentally made too much and now you have some leftover, you cannot apply more than that, what is it, 14.28 fluid ounces per acre per year. Maybe you can be nice and give it to your neighbor. Uh, you cannot sell it to your neighbor. You could give it to them and they would still have to, you know, do all the notifications and, and all that, but you could give it to them or, you know, contact the, the product uh, or whoever you got it from, the dealer and say, hey, do you know anyone that I could give this to? You wouldn't be able to sell it without having your own dealer permit. Um, so there's that. So everybody really should be calibrating their sprayers to know how many gallons of water they're using per acre. Uh, if you have any questions and you need help with that, I'm more than willing to help you out. Um, just give me a buzz, email me, text me, call me, uh, and I can help you through the sprayer calibration so that you know how many gallons of water you're using per acre. And then also you can um, kind of pare that down to yeah, um, product amount per gallon of water. So uh, let me know if you need the help in doing spare calibration and the calculations. So we got a couple information regarding toxicity. We can pull up the SDSs, SDS for you guys. Um, is it more toxic than other products? I'd have to, to say which other products you're comparing it to. Um, there are environmental hazards uh, on the section 18 label as well as the section three label, uh, you know, but those are more environmental, you know, they, they don't take into consideration or they do take into consideration, um, well, the, the amount of PPE you're wearing. That's generally how you can gauge the quote unquote toxicity of a product. Um, so yeah. The, the 45 day, the 45 day PHI uh, post-harvest interval, I'm not sure where that came from. It could have been it could have been existing label languaging. Do you know exactly where the 45 day came from, Greg? Or yeah, 45 day harvest came from uh, the registrant uh, themselves. That that is a number that was provided through uh, you know their extensive use uh, in in other countries and and on other test sites. Yeah, so it's probably gone through. Like we were saying earlier, you need to, you need to, in order to use a product basically anywhere, there's a lot of testing involved. So it was probably one of those tests that had been done to see residues and acceptable, uh, or what do they call it, good, tolerable levels of, 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 and I'm, I'm bad at thousand. 
accepted levels in food. I, I'm not sure exactly, but there's certain levels of things that can be in food and, and whatnot. And so I, I'm assuming that's where that came from. How many pounds per gallon of water is recommended to use? Um, just sufficient water, max is 7.14 fluid ounces and a minimum of 20 gallons per acre. If you can, if you can do, you know, it's, it's, it's up to you guys there on that one. You have leftover contain in the container that it came in. Yes, yes, yes. So if you have leftover in a container that it came in, not mix the original since it's a large container, can we save the rest for a second application, which is months away? Yes, yes, you can. Um, with any pesticide, there's no, you know what I mean? If I went down to the store and bought ant bait, I don't have to use it all in one sitting. Um, it may have restrictions on how much I can use in one sitting, but I'm not gonna have to throw away the rest of the bag. Yeah. On, a, on a few products, there are there is that, but there is uh, there's no expiration date for reactor. Yeah, I appreciate everyone bearing with me. Is everyone pretty happy with their worker protection standards? Everyone, everyone understands what's going on. Uh, if you haven't had a worker protection standard training within the last year. Um, and you need to be trained or you need your workers to be trained. We have a, f a few uh, WPS events coming up and um, the first will be on June 2nd. That's gonna be a webinar, uh, June 3rd, uh, sorry, June 8th uh, at 10 o'clock will be a train the trainer workshop. So if you become trained, trained you will be able to then train your workers uh, on your own time. And then at one o'clock on June 8, we will have a worker protection standard workshop in Spanish. So uh, that all can be found at the hawaiicoffeeed.com website under the events and announcements tab. And um, you can register at that website um, and click the links to find out more information. Um, so just to update everyone on some legislation that did pass in the prior month, you know, I, I'm not sure if many of you were here for the previous PREACS or um, presentations, but uh, SB 855 did pass. Uh, it is awaiting governor's signature. Uh, that, that legislation, that bill basically uh, provided uh, along with the coffee berry borer subsidy, um, a subsidy for... Uh, a list of approved fungicides. Uh, so the pesticides branch is already, you know, we're, we're trying to be proactive so that, you know, you folks can get products quick. Uh, we've developed a list uh, or at least an initial list. Uh, we need to do a little bit more vetting, but that list is pretty much ready and basically uh, good to go once the, the governor signs off. Uh, hopefully he signs off for, for you folks. Um, that subsidy bill. Thank you, Sharon. We appreciate you attending. And everyone, thank you guys. Thank, thank Mitch and Andrea. These guys do. I've been out. And these guys have been doing more than me. So I appreciate, appreciate everyone over here, too. There's no other questions. I mean, we'll be around for a couple more minutes, I, I think. So uh, if anybody has any last minute thoughts and questions, um, please feel free to ask. But thank you very much, everybody. And thank you so much for your patience um, as we had to kind of restart the Zoom with the new link. Um, but I appreciate your time. And I hope that was uh, uh, informational for you. Have a good evening. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.